Okay, I'm now going to talk about Piaget and Kohlberg. Uh, these are both developmental consciences, um, psychological ideas of conscience. So, let's talk about Kohlberg first, because he's a bit shorter and easier to explain than Piaget. Um, Lawrence Kohlberg developed the idea that conscience developed in six stages, um, developed on three levels. So firstly you have the pre-conventional level and this is firstly simple obedience. We just do stuff to avoid being punished. Then as you get a little bit older, get a little bit more cognitively advanced, it develops into instrumental egoism and this is a simple exchange where people can make deals. So I want this, I won't get it unless I do that. That's pretty much as, it, as simple as it gets and that is pre-conventional level happening at very young age and you see it in children where they're willing to barter for things and they just basically do stuff in order that they don't get punished. We then move on to the conventional level and the third stage is interpersonal concordance and this is where we are polite and we meet social expectations. We are just nice to people and we basically are just socially acceptable individuals. Then the fourth is law and order, law and duty to social order and we adhere slightly more to the social order and we follow the laws set down by society. Um, we don't question very much and we accept that in order to maintain a good quality of existence we have to just obey social laws then now that at those that level level four is kind of basically the level that most people are at in society they don't don't see the need to question morality or question society or social order they just do it um then Laura, uh, Kohlberg is saying Lawrence <laughs> Kohlberg saying that there's a further stage which certain people develop to. So you could take philosophers, ethicists, anyone who really um, considers what they're doing and the moral impl impl implications of their actions. So level five is what's called um, consensus building procedures. Now this is where individuals kind of look at society in a more abstract way and they kind of say well why are we doing this and they attempt to build a consensus um, which allows us to have a fully good working and functioning society so this is almost the people who create the law this is what they've done they've said right we need a consensus in the way we're going to act and we'll put this framework into place and then everyone else is um, look in a moral awareness sense, is lower down and simply obeying these consensus building procedures. Then you get to the final level of moral awareness, and this is non-arbitrary, special, social, not special, non-arbitrary social cooperation. And this is where utilitarianism and justice pervade an ethical framework. The principles that individual uses as their moral compass are based on what they believe to be the right and good way to act. We are, we don't comply to social order unquestionably. We don't lay down and we say, all right, yep, yeah, you say I shouldn't steal, so I won't steal. We don't do that. What we do at the non-arbitrary social cooperation level is we obey the law because we believe it needs to be obeyed. We believe there is a moral reason to obey it. That's Kohlberg. Um, and his six levels and it's relatively interesting um, I read the other day actually that his, a bit like Freud he was quite gender biased and women tend to naturally fall onto a lower level of mor morality and moral development lower level of morality and moral development in this theory because actually a lot of the time women tend to uh, this is not my words this is, by the way, this is, I was reading the other day Women tend to be at, say, about a level four, and it's much harder for a woman to get higher up the scale. Um, and what this lady who was writing was saying, that actually Kohlberg is gender biased, and he's placing the morality of men above the morality of women. In actual case, it's not 
it's not that and actually benevolence which is um which is what this woman saw as a key quality of a lot of ladies is is a lot more important in our moral standing um so that was Kohlberg then Piaget he did another developmental understanding of conscience um now what did he say he said there are two phases to our conscience uh firstly it's the heteronomous phase he heteronomous yeah heteronomous I'll go with that <laughs> heteronomous phase of morality which is basically where we are characterized by respect for authority and the power of adults and because of our cognitive e immaturity our egocentric nature basically we simply do what we're told um now the heteronomous phase is because the rules are provided by authority, so our parents, um, any teachers we might be in contact with, these rules by the child are seen as absolute, fixed, unquestionable, um, immutable, they are to be strictly adhered to. Um, and actually what this is, is the child would see the value of the rule above the purpose of the rule. You see it in young children, maybe when they're playing games. No, no, you can't do that. That's against the rules. No, no, no. Um, and they get very stressed out if someone breaks the rules. Um, but often they think it's okay for them to. So that's the egocentric bit as well. Um, there's two. There's two important like key phrases, which is expiatory punishment and imminent justice, and they are both believed in by the child in the heteronomous phase. So expiatory punishment is basically proportional punishment. If you do something not very bad, you'll get a not very bad punishment. If you do something very, very bad, you'll get a very, very bad punishment. And it's that kind of proportional punishment which children see as um, really important. Like, I get it sometimes with like, my sister. Um, if I've I've done something that's wrong, or she, yeah, if I've done something that's wrong, um, my mum's told me off, uh, a lot of the time <laughs> she'll be really annoyed that I've not been punished more you know no send Charlotte out of the garage like that, that yeah that's kind of what I get but um so that's her belief in expiatory punishment um and the imminent justice is that basically bad behavior is always punished um people do not get away with bad things um and it's a very lovely naive thought that we can never not be punished when we do something wrong but as you will see this belief is definitely lost in the autonomous phase of morality. And what Piaget is saying is that as we reach about 10, we start to go into the autonomous moral stage. And this is where um, we've reached a level of cognitive development, cognitive understanding and awareness that decreases our egoism and actually allows us to acknowledge different perspectives. Um, we can see the intentions of an action being incredibly important when judging behaviour. And actually, if someone happens to break a rule, we can we can understand this. We understand that moral rules are flexible in certain circumstances. Um, and we believe now in reciprocal punishment, which is where um, an individual is punished on the basis that that is how you believe the punishment should be if it were you that had done the wrong action. It's a bit like the golden rule and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, the idea that you can't go around wanting people to be beaten up, locked into the garage if they've done something wrong. Um, instead, it should be a punishment which could be universalised, basically. Um, now, Piaget was quite interesting because he based his theory on some data collection and observing children playing games um, and this opens it up to a lot of critique that he's received so firstly some people have said that there have been flaws in the data collection of Piaget so what he did was he observed young children playing marbles um, and people have argued that um, Cementa, S-M-E-T-A-N-A, -A, in 1993, um, researched this and actually said that game rules, um, the rules for marbles, are universal. There's no question about that. However, the moral rules are not universal. There's far more complex procedures, complex thought in morality than what we have about a game of marbles. And actually, to parallel the two, 
and say that because a child sees a game of marbles in a very distinct fashion and these young children who Piaget observed were very big on you can't break that rule, you can't throw the marble there, that's not allowed. Um, because they were doing that with marbles doesn't mean they're going to be doing that with morality because morality is far more fluid. Um, secondly, uh, Piaget used moral stories to understand a child's moral development. And uh, one of the, yeah, I'll read you one of the stories. He said, right, a little boy called John was in his room. He was called down to dinner and went into the dining room. Behind the door, there was a chair, and on the chair, there was a tray with 15 cups. John couldn't have known the chair was behind the door as he was entering the dining room. The door knocked against the tray and fell onto the floor, breaking all the cups. One day, that's, that's one story. One day, a little boy called Henry tried to get some jam out of the cupboard when his mother was out. He climbed onto the chair and stretched out his arm. The jam was too high up and he couldn't reach it. But while he was trying to get it, he knocked over a cup and it fell down and broke. And PJ asked the children which child was naughtier. And that the five, five to ten year olds said, um, and PJ said that the five to ten year olds were able to distinguish between deliberate and inten unintentional acts. So Henry, the boy who wanted the jam when his mum was out and broke one cup, didn't mean to break, um, he did, he was doing an intentionally bad act. He was, you know, going to get some jam when his mum was out. Um, and he, actually, although he didn't, didn't intend to break that one cup, he should have been aware that the cup could be broken. Whereas John, who simply just ran into the room and didn't know the cups were there, he, it was an unintentional act and it, it couldn't have been avoided even if John had like maybe slowed down or something. Whereas Henry's could have. So these children between five to 10 years old were able to distinguish between this. And they said that, um, and they said that actually the Henry was naughty. But younger children said that John was naughtier because he broke 15 cups, whereas um, and Henry only broke one. Now, as you could probably tell from those stories, they're quite confusing. Um, and actually, even when I was thinking about it, I was like, well, I don't think Henry was that bad. He just wanted some jam, but there we go. Um, so these stories are quite long. They're quite confusing. And the way they've been written certainly isn't for optimum child understanding and um, Nelson in 1980 found that the three-year-olds who Piaget would have categorised as um, heteronomous in a, in a heteronomous stage of morality, Nelson found that they were actually able to take intentions into account if the story was more clear um, and it was better to understand. So there might be some issues with the intentions and consequences, not because of a child's cognitive understanding, but actually the way Piaget phrased it. Um, now, the peer interaction hypothesis, this is another thing that Piaget came up with. Um, and he suggested, Piaget suggested that children were helped into autonomous morality when they started going to school. Because... Prior to school, the main people that you speak to and interact with are social superiors, like your parents, um, unless you have a lot of siblings, but usually it's your parents who you engage with the most. And actually, the relationship you have with your parents is one that you shouldn't, you shouldn't be questioning them. You're, you're, not an, you're not an equally powerful participant in the conversations. But when you go to school, you actually be able to come question you actually be able, you're actually able to question certain things because you are equally powerful in the conversation with your friends at school. And so this allows you to develop cognitively because you can question, you can push, you can really try and understand things which you couldn't with just your parents. Um, and there's been support for this peer, peer participation hypothesis by Kruger in 1992. Um, who actually said that, yeah, it is probably true, you know, children, the relationship children have with their parents is a lot more stringent than those we have with our friends, and because of that, we can develop cognitively as soon as we start going to school and engaging with people of a similar age. Um, so there are a lot of strengths and a lot of weaknesses to Piaget's theory, but it, I believe it's kind of, it's suggesting that actually the conscience does develop. So that's Piaget and Kohlberg.